Hi, good afternoon. Uh, today we'll be discussing this book, The Great Degeneration by Neil Ferguson. How institutions decay and economies die. It is based on the BBC Radio 4 Wreath le Lectures in 2012. So this is a quite a thin book. We'll go through it uh, chapter by chapter and it will be like a uh, read with me session where I will be reading each uh, chapter and we'll be discussing uh, about what the uh, what what sections of the chapter means and how it can be uh, it can be referenced to today's uh, situation. Okay, so this book is in, published in two thousand and twelve by Ellen Ellen Lane, an imprint of Penguin Books. It consists of five chapters, four chapters, four chapters, uh, which is introduction, and then chapter one is the human hive. The chapter two is Darwinian, the Darwinian economy. Chapter three, the landscape of law. Chapter four, civil and uncivil societies, and conclusion. So we. It has a list of figures, and I think we'll start with the chapter with the introduction chapter, which is about twenty pages, twenty pages until the first chapter introduction is about twenty pages. So we'll start with the uh, introduction uh, chapter. Introduction. Beyond deleveraging. Almost a quarter of a century ago, in the summer of 1989, Francis Fukuyama could boldly predict an unbashed victory of economic and political liberalism, the triumph of the West, and proclaimed that the end point of mankind's ideological evolution was the universal was the universalization was the universalization of western liberal democracy as the form of human government how different the world looks now economic liber liberalism is a tarnished brand while the proponents of state capitalism in china and elsewhere openly deride western democracy the west is stagnating and not only in economic terms, in 2012, the World Bank expected the European economy to contract and the US to grow by just 2%. China would grow four times faster than that, India three times faster. By 2016, according to the International Monetary Fund, the gross domestic product of China would overtake that of the United States. Those who invested in the West in 1989 have been punished. They have made nothing since 2000. While those who invested in the rest have been richly rewarded. This great reconvergence, recon, great reconvergence is a far more astonishing historical event than the collapse of communism that Fukuyama so astutely anticipated. At the same, at the time he wrote, the world center of economic gravity was still firmly the North Atlantic. Today it is beyond the Urals, and by 2025, it will be just north of Kazakhstan, on roughly the same line of latitude as it was in in the 1500s on the eve of western ascendancy 
The voguish explanation for the Western slowdown is deleveraging. The, the, the term deleveraging. The painful process of debt reduction or balance sheet repair. Certainly, there are few precedents for the scale of debt in the West today. This is only the second time in American history that combined public and private debt has exceeded 250% of GDP. In a survey of 50 countries, the McKinsey Global Institute identifies 45 episodes of deleveraging since 1930s. In only eight of in only eight was the initial debt or was the initial debt to gdp ratio above 250 percent as it is today not only in the u.s but also in all the major english-speaking countries including australia and canada all the major continental european countries including germany plus japan and south korea Okay. The deleveraging argument is that households and banks are struggling to reduce their debts. Having gambled foolishly on ever rising property prices, but as people have sought to spend less and save more, aggregate demand slump. And to prevent this process from generating a lethal debt deflation, Governments and central banks have stepped in with fiscal and monetary stimulus unparalleled in time of peace. Public sector deficits have helped to mitigate the contraction, but they risk transforming a crisis of excess public debt into a crisis of excess public debt. They risk, sorry, they risk transforming a crisis of excess private debt into a crisis of excess public debt. In the same way, the expansion of central bank balance sheet, the monetary base, prevented a cascade of bank failures, but now appears to have diminishing returns in terms of reflation and growth. Yet more, in, more is going on here than just deleveraging. Consider this, the US economy created 2.4 million jobs in the three years beginning in June 2009. In the same period, 3.3 million Americans were awarded disabled workers' benefit. The percentage of working age Americans collecting disability insurance has risen from below 3% in 1990 to 6%. Unemployment is being concealed, the ren the rendered and rendered permanent in ways all too familiar to Europeans. Able bodied people are classified as disabled and never work again and they also and they also stay put. Traditionally around three percent of the United States population moves to a new state each year usually in pursuit of work. The rate has halved since the fiscal, since the financial crisis began in, in 2007. Social mobility has also declined. And unlike the Great Depression of the 1930s, our slight depression is doing little to reduce the yawning inequality in income distribution that has developed over the past three decades. The income share of the top 1% of household rose from 9% in 1997 to 24% in 2007. In declining, it declined by less than 4 percentage points in the subsequent years of crisis. You cannot blame all this on deleveraging. In the United States, the wider debate is about globalization, technological change, education, and fiscal policy. Conservatives tend to emphasize the first and second, which is globalization and te technological change. And as inexorable, inexorable drivers of change, 
destroying low skilled jobs by offshoring or automating them. Liberals refer to see widening inequality as the result of insufficient investment in public education combined with Republican reduction in, in taxation that I have favored the wealthy. But there is good reason to think that there are other forces at work, forces that tend to get overlooked in the tiresome parochial slagging, slanging match that passes for political debate in the United States today. The crisis of public finance is not uniquely American. Japan, Greece, Italy, Ireland, Portugal are also members of the club of countries with public debt in excess of 100% of GDP. India had an even larger cyclical adjusted deficit than the United States in 2010, while Japan faced a bigger challenge to stabilize its debt to GDP ratio at a sustainable level, nor are the twin problems of slow growth and widening inequality confined to the United States. Throughout the English-speaking world, the income share of the top 1% of households has risen since around 1980. The same thing has happened, albeit to a lesser extent, in some European states, notably Finland, Norway, Portugal, as well as many emerging markets including China, already in 2010 there were at least $800,000 millionaires. $800,000 millionaires in China and 65 billionaires. Of the global 1% in 2010, in 1.6 million were Chinese, approaching 4% of the total. Yet other countries, including Europe's most successful economy, Germany, have not become more unequal. While some less developed countries, notably Argentina, have become less equal without, global, be, without becoming more global. By definition, globalization has affected all countries to some degree. So too has the revolution in information technology. Yet the outcomes in terms of growth and distribution vary hugely. To explain these differences, a narrowly economic approach is not sufficient. Take the case for excess debt or leverage. Any high debt, any high indebted economy confronts a narrow range of options. There are essentially three: raising the rate of growth above the rate of interest, thanks to technological innovation and perhaps a judicious use of monetary stimulus. Second option is defaulting on a large portion of the public debt and going into bankruptcy to escape the private debt. And third, wiping out of debt via currency depreciation and inflation. But nothing in mainstream economic theory can predict which of these three or which combination a particular country will select. Why did post-1918 Germany go down the road of hyperinflation? Why did post-1929 America go down the road to of private default and bankruptcy? Why not the other way around? At the time of writing, it seems less and less likely that any major developed economy will be able to inflate away its in its liabilities as happened in so many cases in the 1920s and 1950s. But why not? Milton Friedman's famous dictum that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon leaves um, a monetary phenomenon leaves unanswered the question of who creates the excess money and why they do it. Always 
I, I repeat the Milton Friedman's famous dictum that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Leaves unanswered question of who creates the excess money and why they do it. In practice, inflation is primarily a political phenomenon. Its likelihood is a function of factors like the content of elite education, competition or the lack of it in an economy, the character of the legal system, levels of violence and the political decision-making decision -making process itself. Only by historical methods can we explain why over, past, over the past 30 years so many countries created forms of debt that by design cannot be inflated away and why as a result the next generation will be settled for life with liabilities incurred by their parents and grandparents. In the same way, it is ex easy to explain why the financial crisis was caused by excessively large and leveraged financial institutions, but much harder to explain why, after more than four years of debate, the problem of too big to fail banks has not been solved. Indeed, despite the passage of legislation covering literally thousands of pages, it has got markedly worse. Today, a mere 10 highly diversified financial institutions are responsible for three quarters of total financial assets under management in the United States. Yet the country's largest banks are at least $50 billion short of meeting their new capital requirement based on the new Basel III Accord governing bank capital adequacy again. Only a political and historical approach can explain why Western politicians today call stimulus today call simultaneously for banks to lend more money and for them to shrink their balance sheets. It is why it is it why is it now a hundred times more expensive to bring a new medicine to market than in it was sixty years ago. A new phenomenon, one and request, has called Moore's Law in reverse. Moore's Law in reverse. Why would the Drug and the Food and Drug Administration (FDA) probably prohibited the sale of table salt if it were put for war? Uh, if it put, if it were put forward as a new pharmacological product. Is, is it after all toxic in large uh, is it after all toxic in large dose, doses why to give another suggestive example did it take an american journalist 65 days to get official permission including after a wait up of up to 5 weeks a food protection a food protection certificate to open a lemonade stand in New York City. This is the kind of deb debilitating red tape that development economists often blame for poverty in Africa or Latin America. The rationale for the FDA's rigid standards is to avoid the sale of a drug like th thalidomide. Th thalidomide. I don't know what thalidomide is, but but the, the unintended consequence is almost certainly to allow many more people to die prematurely than would have died from side effects under a less restrictive regime. We count and recount the cause of such side, such side effects we do not count the cost of not allowing new drugs to be made available. Why exactly has social mobility declined in the United States in the past 30 years? So that the probability has more than halved that a man born into the bottom 25% of the income distribution will end, will end his life in the top, in the top quartile. Once 
the United States was famed as a land of opportunity where family could leap from rags to riches in a generation. But today, if you are born to parents in the bottom income quintile, you have just a 5% chance of getting into the top quintile without a college degree, what Charles Murray has called the cognitive elite, educated at exclusive private universities, intermarried and congregated in a few super zip codes, looks increasingly like a new caste equipped with the wealth and power to override the effects of mean reversion in human reproduction so that even their dimmer progeny inherit their lifestyle we have a sub chapter here the stationary state in a seldom quoted passage of the wealth of nation from the wealth of nations Adam Smith described that what he called the stationary state, the condition of a formerly wealthy country that has ceased to grow. What were the characteristics of this state? Significantly, Smith singled out its social regressive character. First, wages for the majority of the people were miserably low. This is the quote from uh, The Wealth of Nations. Though the wealth of a country should be very great, yet if it has been long stationary, we must not expect to find the wages of labor very high in it. It is in the progressive state, while the society is advancing to further acquisition, rather than when it has acquired its full complement of riches that the condition of the laboring poor of the great body of the people seems to be the happiest and the most comfortable it is hard in the stationary and miserable in the declining state the progressive state is in reality a cheerful and the hearty state to all the different orders of the society. The stationary is dull, the declining melancholy. The second hallmark of the stationary state has uh, the ability, that was the, the, the quote from Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, about stationary states. The second hallmark of the stationary state has the ability of a corrupt and monopolistic elite to exploit the system of law and administration to their own advantage. This is the quote, the second quote from Adam Smith, uh, Wealth of Nations. In a country to where, though the rich or the owners of large capital enjoy a good deal of security, the poor or the owners of small capital enjoy scarce any, but are liable under the pretense of justice to be pillaged and plundered at any time by the inferior mandarins the quantity of stock employed in all the different branches of business transacted within it can never be equal to what the nature and content and extent of that business might admit in every different branch, the oppression of the poor must establish the monopoly of the rich, who, by engrossing the whole trade to themselves, will be able to make very large profits. That was the quote. End quote. End of quote. I identify, I here is uh, Professor Ferguson, I identify the Western readers not to feel an uneasy sense of recognition or in contemplating those two passages. In Smith's day, of course, it was China that has been long stationary, a once opulent country that had simply ceased to grow. Smith blamed China's defective laws and institutions, including its bureaucracy, for the stasis. More free, tra more free trade, more encouragement for small business, less bureaucracy and less crony capitalism 
This was Smith's prescription to cure Chinese stasis. It was a witness. What is the cure? What is Smith's cure? It is more free trade, more encouragement for small businesses, less bureaucracy, and less crony capitalism. These were Smith's prescription to cure Chinese stasis. He was a witness to what such reforms were doing in the late 18th century to galvanize the economy of the British Isles and its American colonies. Today, by contrast, if Smith could revisit those same places, he would behold an extraordinary reversal of fortunes. It is we Westerners who are in the stationary state, while China is growing faster than any other major economy in the world. The boot of economic history is on the other foot. This book is about the causes of our stationary state. It is inspired by Smith's insight that both stagnation and growth are in large measure the results of laws and institutions. Its central thesis is that what was true of China in Smith's day is true of large parts of, world, of the Western world in our time. It is our laws and institutions that are the problem. The great regression, the great recession is merely a symptom of a more profound great degeneration. This is a uh, next subtector, the four black boxes. To demonstrate th that Western institutions have indeed degenerated, I am going to have to open up some long sealed black boxes. Black boxes. The first is the one labeled democracy. The second is labeled capitalism. The third is the rule of law. And the fourth is civil society. Together, they are the key components of our civilization. I want to show that inside these political, economic, legal, and social black boxes are highly complex sets of interlocking institutions. Like the circuit boards inside your computers or smartphones, it is these institutions that make the gadget work. If it, it, if it, if it stops working, it is probably because of a defect in the institutional wiring. You cannot understand what is wrong just by looking at the shiny casing. You need to look inside. Perhaps on reflection, that electronic metaphor is the wrong one. After all, most institutions evolve organically. They are not or designed in California by the historically historical equivalent of Steve Jobs. A better analogy might be with the collective structures we see in the natural world, beehives. Beehives are the classic example. Ever since the satirist Bernard Mandeville, Mandeville's book, The Fable of the Bees or Private Vices, Public Benefits, published in 1714, People have drawn parallels between humans in a market economy and beer in a bees in a hive. The parallel has its merits, as we shall see, though it is actually in our political organizations rather than our economy organization that we most closely resemble bees. A point Mandeville's well understood. The simple point is that institutions are to humans what hives are to bees. They are the structures within which we organize ourselves as groups. We know when you know when you are inside one, just as a bee knows when it is in the hive. Institutions have bound arise often walls and crucially they have rules. For some readers, I dare say, the institution, the word institution still conjures up a Victorian vision of a lunatic asylum. Poor old Nail, he's, he's in an institution now. It is, okay, it is a joke. That, that is not the kind of institution I mean. 
I am talking about the example, for example, political institutions like the British Parliament or the American Congress. When we talk about the democracy, we are in fact referring to a number of different interlocking institutions, people sticking pieces of paper into ballot boxes, yes, their elected representatives making speeches and voting in large assembly hall, yes, but those things alone do not automatically give you democracy. Outwardly, the legislators of countries like Russia and Venezuela are elected, but neither qualifies as a true democracy in the eyes of impartial observers, not to mention those of local 